Self-awareness. So this is where I'm going to dig in a little bit. So undoubtedly, most of you believe you know yourselves well. I don't have the polling device, but if I were to ask you for a show of hands, what percentage of accuracy do you think you, you, have about yourself, who you are, how you come across, your strengths, your areas for development? So let's say we start at the 10%, or we go all the way up to 100%. What's, what's your guess, if someone doesn't mind just speaking up? Okay, we hear 75. Do we hear 60? Do we hear 50? Do we hear 40? I told you, auctioneer. So um, it's usually somewhere around 35 to 60 for most people. Unless, I like to joke and say, um, no, I live, I don't know, I've lived in Boston, but it's been a while. So I live near New York. So New York, everybody goes to therapy. <laughs> and we, by the way, have, we have a lifetime plan for therapy. So who's your therapist next to what do you do for work is the second question that everybody asks. Um, when I go to the Midwest, which is where I'm originally from, Cleveland, Ohio, um, oh, yay, we don't, we don't talk about therapy. When I mention therapy, everybody looks down. But the truth is, if, unless you've gone through therapy or sadly you've had a very traumatic event, occur to you. So I work with a, a foundation, I have to give it a plug, Cancer and Careers, the only foundation in the world that helps people with work issues who have had cancer. And they, most of them have gone through an epiphany and said, I don't want to do this anymore, what I've been doing. I want to do something different. So those are the two categories of people that tend to be very self-aware. Otherwise, unless you're just naturally a self-aware person and you're consistently going out and asking for feedback, and I'll share the other two ways that you can develop self-awareness, you might not be as self-aware as you even may think. So why don't we tend to ask for feedback? Do you think I really want to know how you felt about my presentation when I'm done? No, don't tell me. Because someone's going to say something that I might not like, and I'm kidding. Of course I want to know. I always want to improve. But we don't ask for feedback because we, know, we don't necessarily want to hear what we're going to hear, right? That is the most obvious way to help work on developing your self-awareness. And then there's the, the physical world. So there's mirrors, cameras, recordings, reality television. You're a highly sophisticated, intelligent group. So I have a feeling what I'm going to see here. But how many of you watch reality television? OK. So the rest of you are lying. <laughs> yeah. So the reason that I watch reality television, one reason, other than pure, unadulterated, wonderful pleasure, is that it's a way for you to have role models. So when I'm watching The Bachelor, which my husband absolutely hates, and he says, why do you watch that stupid show? And I say, well, I kind of always think, what would I do or if I were in a house with 22 gorgeous hot guys? <laughs> and he looks at me. So all of those forms of media give you perspective that you might not have because you inadvertently will compare yourself. And then the third way to develop self-awareness is actually yourself. A mantra, imagery, meditation, elevated mental and physical awareness. Physiologically, I'm a fair-skinned person. Um, I was a redhead when I was a kid. I'm, you know, a, I'm sorry, a, a fake blonde right now. But, you know, um, and I can feel my face warming up. And I can feel just physiologically what's happening with me, whether it's anxiety or whether it's impatience or whatever it is. And so I have developed a mantra that I will not share with you, and I will not tweet it out, um, of what I say to myself when I know that I need to control myself and whatever I'm feeling. I once worked with a, a guy, he was probably about 42. He worked at one of the big ratings companies in New York. I won't name the ratings company. And a lovely guy, and out of his feedback, they said, you know, there's one thing that's weird about Jim. And I said, yeah, what is it? And they said, well, when he sits in meetings, he rests his arm on top of his head. And I said, really? Wow. And then about eight people said the same thing. And so I said, well, I guess I have to talk to Jim about this. And he saw it in writing, you know. And I said, Jim, there's one thing I just want to talk to you about. What is this? 
He goes, what are you talking about? I said, you sit and with your arm rested on your head. And he said, and he sat and he looked at me for about 20 seconds and he said, oh, my whole family does that. <laughs> Didn't even realize. Respect is one of my favorite things to talk about. So for some reason, um, we are living in a, in a world of incivility. So one of my favorite older stories of, is I used to be in sales and I would go to a Monday morning staff meeting in New York City and there was a guy who at the time I thought was older named Jim. And Jim, every Monday morning in the staff meeting, would cut his fingernails. Yes. And they would go flying. And while Starbucks has been in business since 1971, this was in the 90s, I guess, and so, you know, we didn't have covers and lids on our coffee cups. We used the, the ceramic ones. Yeah, so everybody would go, ah, there's Jim's nails, you know. And it could be something as simple, and he, by the way, was a lo lovely guy, good at what he did, you know. Um, it could be something as little as that, and by the way, it's usually the little things, or it could be something very large. But respect, the sad truth is that it's been on the downslide for a while, um, people cutting in lines, road rage, use of smartphones in inappropriate places. I just took Amtrak up here. Believe me, I could recount about six conversations I shouldn't have heard. Empathy, the core of working with people is helping and understanding them. When I talk to people and, and say, well, what do you want to do next in your career? What's the next role for you? Um, often they'll say, well, the one thing I want to do is avoid politics. And I'll say, okay, good then go stand in a closet. <laughs> there are politics in every part of our lives, and the best thing you can do in dealing with challenging behavior and politics is be empathetic towards other people's agendas, their personal and their professional agenda. Assertiveness. Well, people get assertiveness and aggressiveness mixed up a lot. Um, I don't know. It, it's, in my opinion, assertiveness is defined as standing up for your opinions, your ideas, your beliefs, and your needs while respecting others. That's what it is. So you're always respecting others, but you're standing up for yourself. And by the way, this includes self-promotion. How many of you love promoting yourselves? Nobody? Come on. Okay, a man in the back. Yay. Oh, another man in the back. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm pretty good at promoting myself, and I, I figured out how to do it. And it's all about the tone, the achievement, looping in other people, and so you're not just giving credit to yourself um, and being really excited about what a difference you've made. You know, So if I said to you, oh, I wrote this fabulous book, I don't know what I want, but I know it's not this, and the third edition came out this year, and what I love about it is I get emails from people all over the world saying, oh, your book helped me, I didn't know what I wanted to do. That's not saying, oh, I'm an amazing author, aren't I fabulous? You know, it's, it's saying I did something that helps people. How fortunate am I? You know, something like that. So. But assertiveness is all about um, your language, your body language, your appropriate facial expressions. Um, you don't, I did coach someone once who used to walk like this, and this was in her 360. It's amazing what people tell you in a 360. She walked like this down the hall. Um, and, and it was really aggressive, you know, and people were like, I, they wouldn't, they, it didn't matter what her gender was. They didn't want anybody, you know, kind of walking at them like that. So how many times have you heard someone say she's really intelligent, but she just doesn't have any common sense? Who has a family member like that? Yes, a few of you. A few years ago, I coached someone at Nickelodeon, and her manager called me frantically and said, Julie, you need to talk to Karen. And I said, what's up? What, what happened with Karen? Well, Karen was called to an impromptu meeting with the president of Nickelodeon at the time, and she brought her lunch. Now, Karen brought her lunch. The president didn't bring her lunch. <laughs> so does anybody get what was kind of askew about that? That seems so common sense. Um, when I asked Karen, why did you bring your lunch to the meeting with the president, she said it was noon and I was hungry. <laughs> Understanding and respecting organizational culture. So I feel strongly that someone who is a leader and possesses executive presence, understands all the elements of organizational culture. 
as listed here. So this is what makes up organizational culture. It's values, it's beliefs, it's people's habits, it's the way they, people, groups, and individuals interact with each other. Um, and it's usually the simple things. It's, it's history, it's mythology, you know, it's everything. Can someone walk in and change the culture of an organization? Not too easily. Even a CEO. Um, it's not easy to do. It's entrenched, you know, depending, of course, how long the company's been around. Has anybody here worked somewhere, or work somewhere now, where you don't quite fit into the culture? Okay. I mean, putting aside the, you know, the male, female thing, which I imagine could color that, but yeah. And what that, you know what that feels like? Because uh, I've only had one experience, I'm fortunate, I've been in business for 16 years on my own. The job I had before I started my business was actually up here in Boston. The company no longer exists. Um, and I knew when I interviewed that I shouldn't go work for the company, but there were specific skills I wanted to develop, so I did. And I felt every day for the year and a half I worked for that company like I had a stone in my shoe. I was walking down the street with a stone in my shoe and I couldn't get the stone out. That's how I felt when I didn't fit into the culture. It's painful, right? So that said, you have a culture that you're working in and you're not gonna change it. And by the way, I do have a funny cultural story, or at least I think it's funny. So I go to New York City like three days a week for clients. And one day I have this client um, who I said, let's meet at Lord & Taylor in the city, in New York City, at the restaurant there. And I'll meet you in the front of the store. And it was, I guess it was opening hour, it was like 10 o'clock in the morning during the week. And I walk in and they're playing, there's this like rows of chairs and they're playing the, um, nas the national anthem. Like th these speakers, not, you know, playing the national anthem. And I was like, and I, I don't know why I started laughing. I don't think the national anthem is funny. I, in fact, I'm very patriotic, but I, I just, it struck me as so odd. And there's, there's security guards and they're going, sit down sit down to everybody. So we're all sitting, we wait for the national anthem to be over, and then we all got up and went to wherever, whatever department we were gonna go to. And I, and I, you know, so I went up to the security guard and I said, do you mind my asking, why were you playing the national anthem? He goes, oh, we've done it for 60 years. And I said, but why? He said, but that's what we do. And I said, oh, okay. It's kind of interesting, you know? It's not a football game, but very odd. But that's their culture, you know? Understand and follow the chain of command. That sounds so basic, doesn't it? It sounds so one-on-one. -on -one. one of the most popular questions I get by the media is, is it okay to go over your boss's head? What's the answer? Unless he's running after you with an ax. That's the only time, and hopefully that never happens. So bypassing the chain of command is never a good idea. I have a client who would go, she was buddies with her boss's boss, and she would confide in him all the time, and her boss was not happy about it, and it did not make for a good career for her. Image. Um, image is um, a significant, well, you know, so it is kind of different theories about whether it's important. I happen to think that people can be a little bit judgmental, and so if I, if you saw me at the conference and um, I reminded you of, you know, your eighth grade teacher and you didn't like her, her name was Mrs. Crabapple, you know, you're not going to like me just because physically I might resemble that person until maybe you get to know me and, and talk to me. But generally speaking, it does take only about 15 seconds for someone to form some sort of impression about you visually. And, you know, it's also with, with image, it's also the little tiny things like the, the nail clipping that I, example that I gave you. So I'm going to give you another one. I have a uh, an acquaintance named Wendy, and Wendy wanted to network with me, so we met at Starbucks, and she got one of those gigantic muffins that the crumbs all fall off of, and um, she placed it on the table, and I looked, and there was no plate, and I'm like, ooh, um, and they've just disproved the five-second rule, as I understand it, so, yeah, so, and so she proceeds to eat the muffin, and then she takes her finger and licks it, and then takes and <laughs> does this on the table. I'm not making this up, I swear. Yeah. And can I ever look at Wendy the same way? No. Um, these are what I call my 11 keys. And 11 is a really 
a lot. It's a long list. So I'm going to just focus on two, the first one and the 11th one, and whip through the other ones. And I will start talking faster and faster and faster, probably not as fast as the gentleman who was talking about teams and talking about mathematical equations. I mean, I said to my table, my goodness, I thought I talked fast, you know? I need to speed it up compared to him. Um, so when, when I talk about 11 keys, these are so easy to understand. You can look at them right here on the slide and know exactly what they mean, right? They are the foundation in my work for relationships and for success at work. And when I'm interviewed by the media, I'm frequently asked, well, Julie, what are the 11 keys that are the most important? And I say, well, to myself, well, silly, if I thought there were more that were important, I wouldn't have 11. Um, your mantra technique sounds mm -hmm. very interesting. <laughs> I'm um, not sure. I know you won't share. <laughs> I'm curious. So I assume that what you're saying to yourself is something positive? Yes, of course. Under it is not negative. Okay. I, don't, I do not try to make myself feel bad. <laughs> myself feel bad. Yeah. <laughs> so how can you help us? learn well, how to apply a mantra technique without, without sort of spilling the, spilling the secret sauce. Yeah, I think, you know, remember when I mentioned the, the guy, Eric, who has meltdowns? Mm -hmm. And I'm working on, with him on creating a mantra. So he said, I do feel when I'm starting to lose it, when I know that, oh, no, I'm going to lose it, and I can't control it. And composure, by the way, is one of the leadership competencies that's very difficult to develop continually, you know, because a lot of it is wiring. And so we're in the process of creating sort of a mantra for him that's going to be language, that's going to make him feel good about himself, that's going to kind of make him feel a little bit more composed. And, and that's all it really is, is just kind of experiment a little bit with that. Right, right. I mean, all those things that you listed are expected, right? Your CFA, your MBA, working hard, doing a good job, being competent, showing up. Those are expected, um, and they're important, and I'm not saying they're not. Um, but what becomes more and more important as you move along in your career are all the things that I talked about briefly today. And is it fair? Um, maybe sometimes not, but it is how people um, learn to trust you, and it's how they judge you, and it's how they base decisions about you and your career. And But you also want to take um, as much accountability for stepping up and asking for things mm -hmm. and um, being assertive, you know. And you don't have to have like a powerhouse personality to do that. You can be very quietly assertive and still be effective. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to, to remember that because we saw some really dynamic personalities at this conference. And, you know, I, you know we're, some of us are kind of looking up going, mm -hmm. wow, I could never do be like Sally, you know, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> But that's not necessary. It's just what's necessary is knowing what you want and what you need and continually making a case for it and communicating effectively about it and not giving up, persevering.